the shooting range. In this episode, Pages of History, a brief history of the Swedish aviation industry. Map guide. New Zealand Cape. And Metal Beasts, a top-tier Soviet fighter. With the release of the Northern Wind update, another long-awaited Soviet supersonic fighter has finally landed in our hangars. Meet the MiG-21 SMT. It becomes a new top Soviet fighter with a BR of 10.3. This is a further development of the MiG-21 series, but with some serious changes that have affected the weapons, the engine, and auxiliary onboard systems altogether. The machine is powered by a twin-shaft turbojet engine with an afterburner, created under the guidance of aircraft designer Sergei Tumansky. The self-sealing fuel tanks are located in the central part of the fuselage, as well as in the space between the spars of the delta wing. The offensive armament consists of a 23mm double-barreled aircraft cannon, and in the frontal part, there's a modern radar waiting to discover all of your potential victims. The new MiG-21 feels extremely confident in the air, both in air battles and in mixed ones. The powerful engine with its afterburner provides the right dynamics for a jet fighter to be effective. But the plane itself became heavier due to the additional fuel tank located on the spine, which restrains you from starting a dogfight with every enemy you meet. On the other hand, you don't have to. You can fight air targets with the new R-60 air-to-air missiles in your arsenal. They survive overloads up to 18G and have excellent maneuverability. Your opponents will have a very hard time trying to dodge them. The main thing is not to launch the missile too close to the target. A distance of one kilometer is quite enough for a confident destruction of an enemy fighter. Let the enemy fly past you, and then immediately launch the missile to follow him. And if it does fail, or the enemy turns out to be extremely dodgy, your cannons will finish the job. The old 30mm cannon got replaced by the G-23-2, with an absolutely insane fire rate of almost 3,400 shots per minute. The only thing that prevents the MiG from violently tearing through enemies one by one is the ammunition of only 200 rounds. Simple calculations or a quick experiment lead to disappointing results. You run out of ammo in just three and a half seconds of continuous firing. You'll have to forget about long bursts on that one. This fighter loves it when you barely touch the left mouse button, wait for the right moment, and only shoot to kill. As for the mixed battles, the new MiG has got the S-24 rockets to use there. And they are no joke, that's for sure. You can find exactly the same ones, for example, on the Il-28 bomber. The fight against ground targets gets a bit tricky, and this aircraft proved to be quite slow to exit a dive. Without proper practice, it's easy to miscalculate and crash into the ground at full speed. And last but not least, let's talk about the onboard systems. They have also been modified compared to the previous model. One of the most useful innovations, the aircraft now has an indicator that warns the pilot about radio exposure just like in helicopters. Its signals allow you to quickly respond to the appearance of enemy anti-aircraft deck and leave the affected area in a timely manner. The Swedish aviation isn't just your usual part of a country's industry. It's a vivid example of a special mentality forged by the very nature of harsh Scandinavia. 
There was nowhere to wait for help here. Wasting the very limited resources unwisely meant losing the battle for survival. Winter was always coming and loners didn't stand a chance against it. The strong communities with wise division of labor had a lot better shot at surviving. And later, they became the very Swedes who began their journey through the 20th century as an independent northern kingdom, ready to cope with any task, no matter how complex it was. That, by the way, included defense issues. And in the modern world, any defensive army simply can't exist without military aviation. The first Swedish aircraft were inspired by foreign ones. They were using foreign engines to take off to the sky, but the command realized perfectly that over time, they had to make all key military industries completely domestic. The first feeble attempts to create their own fighters, like the J-6 biplane, weren't very successful. But the aviation science of the Northern Kingdom stubbornly kept carving its own path, in parallel with the global one. And in some instances, it was even more advanced. Look at the J-22, for example. The Swedes took the engine from the American full metal Curtis R-36 and built a wooden fighter. Better armed, more maneuverable, and 50 kilometers per hour faster than the American counterpart. And all of this happened despite the fact that the Swedes hadn't made a single monoplane fighter before that. Another example, it was Sweden that not just created a prototype, but launched the production of an unconventional fighter with a pusher propeller that they called the Saab J-21. No other country in the world has managed to develop aircraft like this so well, not to mention install jet engines in them. But the real heyday of the Swedish aircraft industry began after the war. In the second half of the 40s, aviation technologies and modern equipment were available to almost everyone. Combining foreign experience with their own developments, Swedish aircraft designers created military tech that could compete with the best analogs from the rest of the world. Pretty soon, they had entered foreign markets, challenging the best models from the USA, Great Britain, and the USSR. For instance, look at the J-29 Tonan. This machine got to experience real action only once, during the UN mission in the Congo but it performed excellently there. And the Saab 32 Lansen, that first took off as early as in 1952, remained in service for nearly half a century. Its last modification was finally withdrawn from service only a couple of years before the end of the millennium. However, the Swedish military doctrine in the 20th century was strictly defensive. The country even abandoned the development of its own nuclear weapons. Although, if they really wanted, they surely could have got it. And only in War Thunder can we see a completely different, aggressive side of Swedish nature. Nimble biplanes, top piston engine aircraft, and swift jets will confront anyone who tries disturbing the peaceful neutrality of this harsh northern kingdom. The Update 1.95 brought us a new location for naval battles. New Zealand Cape, a scattering of small islands, peeps out of the water in the middle of a large bay with steep rocky shores. Tactically, the map is divided into two areas, points A and C in the northern part of the map, and a vast area around point B in the south. Not far from A and C, there are respawn areas for destroyers and Mosquito fleet ships. As for the points themselves, they are located completely in the open, so the boats that try to capture them can only rely on their maneuverability and stealth. The nearby small islands can only hide you for a short time, so that you could wait for the right moment in relative safety and then advance 
and get what you can. And of course, be prepared to quickly retreat as soon as the enemy goes on the offensive. As for the destroyers, they feel a lot more comfortable on this map. There aren't any narrow straits that restrict their movements. There's enough space for them to both easily turn around and, if necessary, evade torpedo attacks. But it's not worth rushing to capture points on destroyers. Such decisions will only result in you taking a lot of heavy enemy fire. It's better to wait until the enemy fleet loses in numbers and the artillery duels become less violent. And only then should you slowly advance to capture overcoming minimal enemy resistance. Finally, next to point B, there are cruiser respawn areas. So this point belongs solely to them. Smaller ships won't have much luck here. Picking up a fight with the more armored and heavily armed ships in open water is definitely not a good idea. The little islands located in this part of the map won't interfere with the duel of the cruisers. Projectiles fired from a long distance are quite capable of reaching the enemy behind such a cover. So don't hide. Sure, you'll break visual contact with the enemy hiding behind an island, but you will still remain within reach of his weapons. In general, New Zealand Cape is a fairly open map where covers serve not so much as tactical positions, but as temporary shelters. The main battles here take place in open water, and their outcome heavily depends on who chooses the better moment to attack, or who seizes the moment while the enemy team is distracted to capture a point that they left unwatched. Have you already checked out this new location? Share your impressions under this video. And now, it's time to answer some of your questions from the comments. The first question was sent by a player, Nimori Kandara. New graphics and stuff is what I really want in War Thunder. I love realism and realistic stuffs. Well, thank you for your kind words. We're glad that you liked this update. We've worked hard on it and will continue improving our graphics engine in the future, making it as realistic as possible. Then there is a question sent by Alex Snedka. I have always wondered, can you crush vehicles with heavier vehicles? Sure. You can squash any tech with thin enough armor by simply ramming through it, especially if you press it against a wall or some other obstacle. Random German soldier asks, what are those shield things at the modern German tanks in the back? Hey, you must be talking about formation lights. They're used when a tank convoy is moving during nighttime. These lights are almost invisible to the enemy, but they're bright enough for drivers to see the rear of the tank in front of them and not stray away from the convoy. Another question is written by He77Hawk. I've asked over 22 episodes, why don't kamikaze attacks deal damage and why don't bombs explode upon crashing? We've already answered this question some time ago, but if it's still that pressing, here's another one. Sure, in reality, a bomber falling down would damage things upon impact. But in reality, there were few pilots that would dare to execute such a maneuver. Surprisingly, most of them cared for their lives. Plus, any plane would cost a fortune to assemble. So we've turned this type of damage off, so that players wouldn't be tempted to get easy frags instead of actually bombing their targets. Yes, it's unrealistic, but in the end, it prompts the players to actually stick to more realistic gameplay. And the last message for today was written by Schlungo08. Wouldn't it also be possible that a normal tank is still operational with only one crew member alive? Well, previously, it did work like that. But in time, we came to a conclusion that a tank becomes incapable of fighting with only one conscious crew member. The only exception is the Swedish Sturve 103 that we talked about a couple of episodes ago. 
Due to its unconventional design, it really can be fully controlled by only one person. Well, that's it for today. You've been watching The Shooting Range by Gaijin Entertainment. Subscribe to the channel. Press the bell because it gives a beautiful sound, you know. Doing. Leave a like because you really do. Visit Sweden, it's a great place. And tell us what you think in the comments below. See you in a week.